Secretary. Well, thank you, JP, for your very gracious words. They are certainly appreciated. I uh, wish there was some way we could all see each other face to face today. I remember how hospitable you, are, were, you all were to me when we were in Tahoe about three years ago. Um, I, I felt extremely welcome, and um, you were all so friendly and gracious to me. Uh, but JP, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, um, I just wish it was in a situation where we could be face to face and we could say hello to one another, to greet one another, to shake one another's hand, and to hug one another. But that will hopefully come at another time. In this chapter of Luke, Jesus delivers a beautiful trilogy of parables to answer the grumbling of the scribes and the Pharisees and to present the gospel to them. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sons, and that is plural. The Pharisees were disgusted with Jesus. They couldn't understand why he associated with unclean people like publicans and prostitutes and other types of sinners. They thought such a person could not possibly be the Messiah. The resentment of him was a result of their own self-righteousness. The grumbling indicated that they did not recognize any need in themselves for Jesus. They had no need for his gospel, no need for his cross, no need for his forgiveness of sins. In their legalism and externalism, they were not conscious of any sins they needed to be forgiven of. But with compassion, even for them, Jesus perseveres patiently in explaining to them that he is the promised one who has come to seek and to save those who are lost and who will save anyone who repents of his sins. Now here we have three of the most familiar parables in the Bible. They have several things in common. The most important thing I would have you notice is that all three of these parables, that that which was lost was the possession of the one who lost it. The sheep belonged to the shepherd, the coin belonged to the woman, and the sons belonged to the father. So these parables are about how God restores lost sinners to fellowship with himself, for they truly all belong to him. These parables speak of God's love and God's compassion and God's patience for those who belong to him. Each of these parables emphasize, secondly, the lostness of sinful mankind. Thirdly, all of these emphasize the rescue and restoration of the lost by the Lord himself. No one rescues himself. We see fourthly in all three of these parables that the means of rescue is repentance and a return of that which is lost to its proper place. And in all three parables, there was great joy and rejoicing at the repentance and rescue of that which was lost. Now let's look at each one of these parables. First of all, the parable of the lost sheep, verses 3 through 7. And he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not have the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one who is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. And then Christ's application. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, in this parable, I'd like you to notice three things. The searching shepherd, the lostness of the sheep, and then the joy of the shepherd. There's no hardship. 
no difficulty, no sacrifice, no suffering, no pain is too great to find the one lost sheep and to bring it back home. Now, in the context in which this parable is spoken, is Jesus' journey to Jerusalem to die. Jesus has fixed his face toward Jerusalem. And since he fixed his face to Jerusalem to suffer and to die for sinners, and since those sinners were close at hand, surely Jesus had in mind his own sacrifice and his own pain to save the lost. For the love of God for sinners was demonstrated in his death. As Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now this parable and the one on the lost coin, simple though they may be, highlight the difference between Christianity and every other world religion. All world religions have one thing in common, except for Christianity. Christianity is different than all the rest, and these parables teach us that. Because only in Christianity does God come down and search for man. In every other religion, man must search for God. Christianity is the only religion of divine condescension. Divine grace and divine initiative. All other religions focus on man and what he must do to get to God. In no other religion in the world does someone come to know God as the one who, in his love, seeks the lost to save them through his grace. You can look through all the writings of all the world religions and it is all about men searching for God. When you read the parable of the lost sheep along with all the other books of the Bible, it's obvious that Christianity is the story of God's search for man. Now the lostness of the sheep, the sheep had wandered away from the flock. It had gone its own way. It refused to follow the voice of the shepherd and tried to make it on its own to pastures in search of food. And it had become lost and it was unable to find its way back to the shepherd. It had placed itself in danger from all sides from which it could find no escape. Left to itself that one sheep surely and most certainly would have died. Now, I hate to contradict probably one of my favorite hymns about the 99 that were safe in the fold, if you remember, because I think this flock of sheep refers to the Jewish nation. And the 99 that he left does not refer to saved people. They represent the Pharisees and their followers. Notice what it says about them. It says in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Do you know of anyone who doesn't need repentance? There's no such person. The point is, these are people who declared themselves righteous, who were not conscious of the need of repentance. They represent the Pharisees and their followers who didn't see themselves as lost and in need of rescue. They saw themselves as the righteous who had no need for repentance. They felt secure in their own good works. So in a sense, the 99 were lost, although they didn't know it and they weren't willing to certainly admit it. So we must not infer from the parable that the 99 in that field were safe. The point is that they had no need for the shepherd. They were self-righteous. And Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. He did not come to call those who considered themselves righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
Jesus did not come to save the self-righteous Pharisees. In fact, he came to hide the truth from those who saw themselves as wise and righteous and then to reveal it to babes. That's exactly what he said in Matthew 11, 25 and 26 in his prayer to God. He said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. If all of us do not see ourselves in this one lost sheep, instead identify ourselves with the 99 sheep safe in this fold who didn't go astray, the result is we are identifying ourselves with those Pharisees and scribes who murmured against Christ because he received sinners and he ate with them. So the important point for us to bear in mind here is that the way to God begins with the recognition that we are lost in our sins. The Pharisees wouldn't admit to it. And our only hope is the search and the rescue of the good shepherd himself. The self-righteous see no need. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him, that is Christ, the iniquity of us all. In Psalm 119, 176, the psalmist confesses, I have gone astray like sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commands. 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 say, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually strained like sheep, and now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So if you are a person who takes great pride in your righteousness, your supposed goodness, you don't see any great need for radical deep repentance and admitting that you are lost without Christ. But the only one who could do you any good is this good shepherd, or you will never be found. You will remain lost and never know it until you wake up in hell, because Jesus came not for the righteous, but sinners who repent, who turn from their sin and their degradation and embrace he alone who died to bring them saving grace. Then we see the joy of the shepherd. We see the lost sheep is found, and heaven resounds with rejoicing. And this rejoicing is in sharp contrast to the grumbling and the murmuring of the Pharisees. Jesus emphasizes the joy of the shepherd at the finding and rescuing of the lost sheep. But the Pharisees? rejoiced more over God's destruction of the unrighteous and the unclean than they did over the salvation of the lost. Now, why was Jesus so happy and full of joy when the sheep was rescued? Well, first of all, there was never any doubt about it for him. The sheep that belong to him will never perish he rejoiced as a mother who receives her child back to health after a near-death illness. But the reason for Jesus' joy is much deeper. For Jesus died for his sheep. He said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Second, Jesus loves his sheep. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I know or love my own, and my own know or love me. Thirdly, in rescuing the lost, Jesus is doing the will of his Father in heaven. It is the will of God that not one of his chosen sheep should ever, ever perish. And fourth, in finding and restoring those who are lost, Jesus is creating and gathering his church. 
And his joy is complete only in the salvation of all those whom God gave him to save. What does scripture say about living the Christian life? It says it is a race. We must run it diligently, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy Jesus saw in the cross? Well, we see it in Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the travail of his soul, the travail of his soul, and be satisfied. Jesus, like a mother who goes through a great anguish of childbirth, when she sees the baby, she is so happy. And the joy that Jesus saw on the cross, the travail that he went through, he went through gladly because he knew that it would result in the salvation of all those whom he came to earth to save. Now I'd like you to notice that it is the shepherd who brings the sheep back. The sheep doesn't find its way back on its own. It's too blind. It's, it's too dumb. And I hope you understand that that is why God calls us sheep. It's not complimentary, my friends. It is not because we are soft and fuzzy. Sheep are one of the dumbest of God's animals, and they have absolutely horrible eyesight. If God really wanted to compliment you, he would call you the pigs of God. Did you know that pigs are one of the smartest animals in God's kingdom? But he calls us sheep. The sheep didn't find its way back. The shepherd brought him back. He put him on his shoulders and he carried the sheep back home. You see, it's all his work. And that joy that everyone experienced is a joy based on repentance. The lost that Jesus rescues are repentant sinners. When a sinner recognizes he is lost and in need of a Savior and repents and comes to Christ, the entire universe rejoices. Heaven resounds in laughter. But this rejoicing is not by the 99. And the rejoicing is not for the 99. We don't read anything about them joining in the rejoicing. In fact, verse 7 says, literally, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner who repents rather than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Without repentance, without love for Christ as Savior, the Pharisees couldn't rejoice. They had no basis for joy. I would also like you to notice the certainty with which Jesus speaks about what's going on in heaven. This isn't guesswork for him. He's saying, by the way, I'll tell you what it's like in heaven. When one person repents, angels and God and everyone else rejoices. And how did he know? How could he be so certain about what's going on in heaven? He's been there. He is God incarnate. In the flesh, in human form. So, what is the application? Jesus calls you and me to tell the lost that there is a good shepherd who sacrificed himself to save the lost. We are to tell our friends and neighbors that they are lost unless they repent. We must tell them that they must repent of their lostness and believe in the shepherd and that their rescue is all wrapped up in their admittance, that they are lost and are in need of this saving shepherd. And we are to tell them that when they are found, 
And when they repent, they are to rejoice with Jesus, for he found his sheep that was lost. Now that brings us to the parable of the lost coin. Look at verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin which I had lost. And in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now Luke loves to present truth in pairs of parables. And usually when he tells a story about a man, he tells one about a woman. The story about the shepherd and his lost sheep is followed by the woman and her lost coin. And as one commentator said in describing this parable, the story, because of its brevity, sparkles with beauty. It reveals all of the emotions of anxiety, worry, elation, and joy in only a sentence or two, yet the story is complete. Jesus paints a picture of a woman who owned ten silver coins, probably worn in ornaments of her hair, headdress. Now, these coins were probably her dowry, and she cherished those coins as a woman today would cherish her wedding ring. One of the coins becomes detached, and it falls off before she realizes it. And, and like a woman who notices a diamond missing from her wedding ring, she searches diligently, turning everything in the house upside down to find the coin. While the emphasis in the first parable was on the effort of the shepherd to seek the lost sheep until he found it, the emphasis in this parable is on the thoroughness of the woman's search for her lost coin. And when she finds her precious coin, she calls together all of her friends and her family and neighbors to celebrate and to rejoice with her. Then Jesus makes this application in verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, before we go on, that is a great picture, is it not? Heaven is full of laughter and joy. Angels are laughing. Christians who have died before are laughing. God is laughing. They're all rejoicing and celebrating in heaven. And the house of the woman was filled with happiness and laughter because she found that which was lost. And so heaven rejoices when a sinner repents and turns to God in faith. As the woman rejoiced before her friends and neighbors and family, so God rejoices before his angels. And as the coin belonged to the woman who diligently searched for it while it was lost, so the sinner who repents is the sinner who belongs to God. Because God is not willing that any of his chosen ones should perish, but that all of them, all of them should come to repentance. These two parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, have an obvious evangelistic thrust. Jesus included his church in his mission to save the lost in the world. In his high priestly prayer to his father in John 17, 18, he said, As you sent me into the world... I also have sent them into the world to do what you sent me to do. That is to seek and to save those who are lost. I think a picture we need to keep in our minds is that God the Father has the world of lost sinners on his heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God the Son has the world of lost sinners on his heart. He said, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also, which I shall give for the life of the world, is my flesh. And God the Holy Spirit has the world of lost sinners on his heart. 
Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He will glorify me, for He shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. And so I ask you, is the world of lost sinners on your heart? Do you think about it? Does it ever burden you? Does it ever motivate you to witness to someone? Is the world on your heart as it was on Christ's heart and the Father's heart and the Holy Spirit's heart? One commentator by the name of Kistelmacher said, The fervor and joy displayed in Jesus' mission to the lost in the world must glow in every member of Christ's church radiating the warmth of evangelistic zeal and rejoicing with the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I'll tell you where there is real joy. There is joy in the heart of someone who has the world on his heart and he sees someone repent and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that you? Then we come to the parable of the lost sons. Verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered up everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine fell on that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to a census, he said, How? Many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and I'll go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. And he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice the father doesn't give him an opportunity to even finish his little speech. But the father said to his slaves, quickly go bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf. Kill it and let us eat and be merry for this son of mine was dead. Dead in his sin. And he has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring, what were these things, what, what might these things be? And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, and he was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. Really? And yet you have never given me a kid goat that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattest calf for him. And he said to him, my child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. The very, this very famous parable has been called the gospel within the gospel because of the graphic portrayal of gospel truths. 
It's closely linked with the two previous parables in that its emphasis falls on the seeking and saving love of God, as well as on the necessity of repentance and returning back to where you belong. In this parable, each member of Jesus' audience could see himself. Every person present was forced by the mirror of this little parable to see himself as he really was. The prodigal son portrayed the immoral and social outcast, the untouchables. The older son portrayed the self-righteous Jewish leaders. They couldn't help but see themselves in this parable. Also, who's the father? He's obviously God the father. And the parable focuses on his love for his children, even when they are wayward. He loved both of his sons dearly. And his love never changed for either one of them. Although his son strayed from home, the father continued to love him. Let me read you two or three quotes from Pastor Herman Hokema about the love of God portrayed in this parable. He said, This is the picture of the unchanged love of God. God's love is eternal. It is a love that is from eternity to eternity the same. It is a love that is rooted in God's own being. It is not a love that is dependent on the people whom God loves, for then it would change as they change. But God loves himself. He loves his own purpose and work. He loves his own name and the cause which he determined in his counsel to realize. And his love for his people is rooted in himself. And in his own unchangeable purpose to save his people. It is a love that is toward his people even when they are still sinners. That's a very important thing to bear in mind. Jesus did not die on the cross to win God's love for us. Jesus did not die on the cross to make it possible for God to love us. God determined his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is not to secure God's love. The death of cross was because God had always loved those who he sent his son to die for. It is a love that is absolutely first. For this is love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us. It is a love that is not affected or altered by sins we commit. I'm sure you've sung the hymn that says, Though we oft have sinned against him, still his love and grace abide. It is because of this love that we remain sons. God has made us sons eternally through his shed blood on the cross. He chose to be chose us to be his sons before we were born or saw the day of light. He adopted us as sons in his eternal love for us. When we disown our father and choose rather the pleasures of sin, still he remains our father. Though we deny our sonship and scorn his fatherhood, he maintains his promise faithfully and remains our father through it all. Pastor Hanko says, But God's love is not only unchangeable, it is also absolutely sovereign. Though the proud heresies of Arminian and Pelagius maintain that we turn to God for our own free will and initiate the beginning of our restoration, this is a lie. It is the love of the Father which follows His Son to the distant land. It is the love of God which follows us wherever we wander. First, God love, this is Hanko again. First, God's love brings trouble on us. The heavy hand of chastisement comes upon us. And by this we see the utter hopelessness of sin's folly and the inability of the pleasures of life to bring us satisfaction and contentment. Sometimes we are the lowest extremity of need when our condition becomes hopeless and filled with despair, but it is always the hand of God's love. For God loves every son whom he chastens. 
and his love follows us down to the dark paths of sin. His love is revealed in the difficult trials with the purpose of bringing us back. When by these chastisements, we have seen the hopelessness of our life without our Father. Our thoughts are brought back to him again and to our Father's house. In this way, the love of God beckons us again to the joys of our Father's house. When we leave it in the futile and empty pursuit of pleasure, it seems drab and monotonous. But in the despairing miseries and hopelessness of sin, God's love reminds us of the blessings which we receive in His house. There in the house of God is God's comforting word, the word of our Father to speak to us in our need. There is true happiness and joy in the fellowship of the saints. In that house is peace and safety. True friends are to be found, true joy, true satisfaction for every want. It is the love of God that draws us to our home. End quote. And this parable is about God the Father's unchangeable love and unmerited grace for those who belong to him. So we come to the younger son that ran off, and any Jew of the first century that knew his Bible knew God had a wayward son. Jeremy, J Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19, quote if Ephraim, which is another name for Israel, and he says, Restore me, and I will return, because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. So the younger son was the moral outcast of that day. The lost of Israel who recognized their lostness, repented and came home to the father. Now notice how lost this young man was. The young man wants his inheritance immediately, which was perfectly legal in that day. And it amounted to one-third of his father's wealth. He wanted his inheritance so he could spend it in the satisfaction of his own wicked desires and the pursuit of his own goals and sinful pleasures. So he breaks away from his father. And he goes to a distant land to get as far away as possible from the eye of his father. So that he could sin all he wanted without restraint or guilt or consequences. As a result, he wasted all he had, including himself in riotous living. And he exchanged the real freedom that consisted in obedience to his father in his father's house for the slavery of sinful rebellion. One commentator said, Thus the life of sin and error is in its deepest and innermost nature the rebellious breaking away of man's life from God. Under a deceptive yearning for so-called freedom, such a person enters the distant land of sin, there to waste in selfishness and dissipation the precious gifts which he had received from God. All those things which a man wastes and destroys when he lives in sin, he received from God as gifts wherewith to glorify God and to experience real happiness in life. End quote. So after he left home to the distant land, then his troubles really started. First he ran out of money. Then his friends left him. Then he was bloated with lust and pleasure. He'd had enough. What once attracted him no longer attracted him. He had drunk the cup of pleasure to the full, and the life of rejoicing and pleasure that he sought had turned to ashes in his mouth. Nothing satisfied him. And if that wasn't enough, God loved him so much, he sent a famine to starve him to the verge of death. And then came the final degradation. He was so hungry. He didn't have any money, so he found a job feeding pigs. Now, for a Jew to feed, feed pigs, he had to have really reached a low point. They believed it rendered you unclean. It separated you from Jehovah. It was a sin to have anything to do with pigs in the first century Israel. 
And then the famine worsened. So we had to get down and he had to eat pig slop in the trough with the pigs. And there was not enough for the pigs and for himself. So he could not escape the gnawing pain that would not go away. Then by God's grace, the young man began to think about home and the condition he was in at present. The Bible says brilliantly, he came to his senses. He recognized his true condition and his guilt. He repented of his sins and was, re was determined to return home to his father to confess his sins and to find restoration as a mere slave in his father's house. The first step toward true repentance then is that a man should become conscious of the misery into which he has fallen. And notice this remorse did not turn to despondency. It also had faith with it because he had faith that his father would not reject him when he came into the door of his father's house. So it is clear that this man had come to true repentance and the realization of his guilt. Now, above all, he bewells his deep guilt and desires to, to utter no other words but those of unconditional confession of sin. He writes out a little speech so he doesn't forget it, and he admits he has sinned against God and sinned against his father. He's not worthy to be a son of his father, whereas he formally and self-sufficiently demanded all of his inheritance. Now he is living in humility. He, he's, he's quite willing to take the lowest position just to be in his father's house. We learn here that real remorse and the unconditional confession of sin are the indispensable requirements of true repentance. Then when the young man comes home, what he receives from his father, he, he, he could never have imagined. For, you see, his father had never stopped loving him. He never stopped watching for him. In fact, when he saw him coming from afar off, he immediately, driven by love for his son, ran to meet him, embraced him, and kissed him. The young son is profoundly touched. And he be begins to recite his thought-out confession. But his father does not let him complete that confession. The forgiveness of the father was immediate. He receives the son back as his son immediately, not as a slave. He commands the servants, go get a robe, go get a ring, go get sandals for his feet. I am fully accepting my son back as my son, and I am restoring him to a place of honor in this household. And then he orders the killing of a fatted calf to have a joyful banquet, a time of celebration because his son, who was practically dead and lost to his father, had come home and had come back to life. Everyone rejoiced, but one person. This is the way God receives every lost sinner who repents and turns to him. He receives him freely. He receives him without reproach. The young man comes and the father hugs him and, and, and kisses him. He has a confession and his father doesn't jump all over him and question him about all the squandered money. He doesn't say, what did you do with all that money? That was a sinful thing of wasting my money that was dishonoring to me. He doesn't say a thing. He, he doesn't even let him finish his speech. And that's the way God receives repentant sinners. No condemnation. Now, who is this older son? If you were there that day and you heard this parable and you were a Pharisee, you would know good and well what Jesus was talking about. For you see, the Jewish leaders of that day saw no need for repentance, just like this older son. They couldn't understand why this father was so joyful. They were just like the older son. He couldn't understand why the father was so joyful about the homecoming of his good-for-nothing, rebellious, unclean son. 
The older son failed to notice that the father goes out to entreat him to come in as he welcomed the younger son. The father wasn't biased. He had no favorites. He treated both of his sons with the same tenderness and affection. But the older son complained that his father never threw a party for him, although he stayed home and he worked for his father all along. One commentator says, The sin of the older brother was the sin of criticism of his father's love. He resented the fact that his father loved his younger brother when that brother had wandered in the ways of sin. And this criticism of his father's love was rooted in an inability on his part to love either his father or his brother. He hated his brother and was sorry that his brother had returned and he hated his father for loving his brother. End quote. He said to his father, I've worked for you. I've done everything you have told me to do. I've taken pains to obey all of your commands. It appears as if he was very proud of his diligent labor and of his service to his father. And he felt that he has a right to his father's approval. That is a typical picture of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. You see, this self-righteous older son didn't understand the true meaning of being a son, and as a result, he failed to understand what it means to say that God is a father. The older son did not understand the significance of being a son to be always in the presence of your father as his beloved son and heir. That is what it is to be a Christian, beloved. That is what sonship in the family of God means, which is to be always in the presence of your father as his beloved son and heir. And fathers, that is what it means to be a human father. Your son may wander in a distant land and misunderstand sonship if he does not learn to enjoy living in your presence as your son and heir now. And for him to live in your presence, dad, you have to be there to love him. With the return of the younger son, and the father's joy at his return, the older brother, older son spoke to his father in words that were very sharp and bitter. He refused to call his father, father. He refused to call his brother, brother. And notice in verses 29 and 30, he says with contempt, look for so many years, I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet, you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, this son of yours comes, who had devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Listen to what one commentator said. With those words, the older son grieved his father, just as much as the prodigal son had done by his wild living. The elder brother separated himself just as far from the father as the younger son had done. The one had come home. The father pleaded with the other to do likewise. But the elder and the younger sons were sons of the father, and the father had dressed the elder as tenderly as he addressed the younger son. He said in verses 31 and 32, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours, but you had to be merry and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and was lost, and has been found. Now, that's the end of the story. Jesus doesn't tell you what happened. Did the older son start celebrating, saying, You're right, Father, I'm such a miserable sinner. You're right, I have had such a high view of myself. I repent. Let's go celebrate my younger brother's coming home. Or, or did the older brother say, forget it, dad, forget it, you hypocrite, I don't want any of your favoritism. We don't know what happened. But that was a brilliant way Jesus had said that the older son turned around and walked away. You see, the door is still open 
for Pharisees, for lost sinners. If Jesus had shut, said that the older brother turned away and walked away, he would have shut the door of salvation right in the Pharisee's face, right in the lost sinner's face. But he kept it open. Self-righteousness and pride in self. And our accomplishments go hand in hand. And in a heart filled with pride, there is no room for the love of God. When pride conquers us, we begin to believe that we can earn God's favor and make God obligated to bless us. As Herman Hanko said, all this is true because pride blinds one to the cross, end quote. The Pharisees saw no need for the cross. They were without sin in their own eyes. They needed no suffering Savior to atone for their sins, for they had no sins which needed atoning for. And they could not understand the love of God in Christ for publicans and sinners like you and I, for whom Christ shed his own blood. They hated God's love in Christ for sinners. Because they hated the cross, which is the highest manifestation of that love. Always pride closes one's eyes to the cross. And unable to see the cross, one becomes unable to see God's love in Christ through the cross for those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. Let me ask you one question and then we're finished. Where is Jesus in this parable? We've got a loving father. We've got a rebellious son who comes and the father sitting on the porch waiting for him. But where does Jesus fit in? Is this parable about the mercy of God without Jesus? Is this a parable about Christianity without Christ? The only way to answer that question is see the parable in light of its context, which is, beloved, the entire Bible. The Bible since the fall of man into sin until the consummation of the second coming of Christ is a running commentary on the parable of the prodigal sons. Where is Jesus? It is Jesus who's telling the story. It is Jesus who will later open the way to the Father's house by his own sacrifice. It is Jesus who invites undeserving sinners to come home. And it is Jesus who sends his spirit to enable us to come. What is the gospel in this parable? Simply and profoundly this. Everyone who has turned his or her back on God in order to live his life without God will, when he repents, find A loving father with outstretched arms waiting for his return to him. There's always a welcoming home coming for all who repent and turn back to God as his Lord and Savior. My friends all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. We're all in the same boat. But out of love for his people, God sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a life of sinless humiliation on earth with us for 33 years. And then God the Father sent him to die on a cross, shedding his blood so our sins might be forgiven. If we put our faith in him, and put our trust in his holy, infallible word. Right now, right this minute, cry out to God for forgiveness and repent of your sins, turning from them, and embrace Christ. For he is the only Savior who can wash your sins away, giving you the strength, the motivation, the power to live a righteous and holy life. And guarantee you will not spend an eternity Paying the price of your sinful rebellion in eternal hell. Fire. Repent and our God who is full of grace and mercy. 
will grant you eternal peace. Now, because you are here listening to this message today, you can be sure, just like the shepherd who left his flock in search of his one lost sheep, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, is pursuing you who was lost in your sin. And just as the prodigal son's father, let our heavenly father lovingly embrace you as his son and rejoice and celebrate this very day. Celebrate with all the heavenly host, like the prodigal son who has given up his wicked ways and returned home. Amen. Let us pray. Help us, Father, to be faithful.